All right, we are live. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Serious Angler podcast. Uh, today we have a pretty cool episode. Uh, I know you guys like to get on some of these pros as as much as you guys like to hear some about people whose names that you might not have heard of. Uh, so a name you've definitely heard of, uh, Brandon Cobb, is going to come on here today. We're going to talk fishing with him, uh, learn about his roots into fishing. Uh, definitely somebody we can learn from, but I'm really in- interested and intrigued to hear kind of his childhood, how he got into fishing, and the timeline to where he's he's gotten into today. So without further ado, we're going to bring him in here, Mr. Brandon Cobb. What's going on, man? No, not much. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, I want to I want to preface this. This is not actually live. I got to stop saying we're live. Like in my corner when I click record, it says live up there. <laughs> I see. So I, I've scared some people when I'm like when I say like, oh, we're live. They, they'll ask me at the beginning. They're like, wait, are we actually live? And they're like, no, 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 sorry. <laughs> it's all good i'll yeah. say something stupid whether we're live or not so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> well hey stupid comments are welcome on the show, i'll tell you that but are you home now or did you just I, did you make the track I, I am yeah i did terribly and uh well i did terribly the second day did decent the first day but i left uh left straight from way in drove about halfway home then got home the next day from up there it's like 16 hours so i split into two days Oh, okay, that's not too bad. Not <laughs> not, not too bad. Awful, but and probably pretty rough to do in one one run. I did yeah. uh, I did twenty one about a month ago. I went down to Florida to visit my parents before I'm up in New York. Okay. So it, I did literally this morning, like the morning, I want to I went to leave with my brother. Uh, we were gonna go visit our grandparents for two weeks during this whole madness, and uh, literally the day we left, Cuomo said, you know, if you come from Florida. You have to quarantine for two weeks when you get back. We're, we're literally about to leave, and it, we see this on the news. We're like, well, we're not turning around now, but 21 hours, we did straight shot, which is yeah. kind of rough. But. I've done it before. Yeah. As I tell everybody, we're truck drivers that fish a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what we do. No kidding. <laughs> and don't get paid to drive. So. <laughs> yeah, literally, that's it's got to be tough. Like. I can't even imagine the amount of miles and then if you probably put it in, like into numbers, the amount of miles you guys put in a year and then the amount of money in boat and truck gas. It, it, it gets, it gets out of hand. You can be smart with it, but it gets, uh, it gets expensive. Yeah. Cause a lot of guys would like, leave their boat and truck and then fly instead, especially if they're West coasters. They, they do. Yeah. All my buddies from the West coast, they leave their boat and truck at kind of a central location, but that's the good thing where I am South Carolina. I mean, the longest drive I ever have is probably 18 hours. Eight, uh, like even to Texas to Forks, 18, up north, 16 usually. Florida is about 10. So South Carolina is a pretty good central location. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of similar to like a Tennessee, except there's probably a lot yep. more tournaments near, near Tennessee yeah. and Kentucky. And then, then. Uh, oh, yeah. That's what my area has got like 10 tournament class lakes probably within a few hours. So there you go. It's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. So how was, I know you said you had a rough day day two on Champlain, but what, what was your strategy going into that? We won't get into too much, but just kind of yeah. Bit. Yeah. So Champlain, I was, uh, I wanted to fish for largemouth, and, and the problem was it wasn't really conducive to it because the lake was down yeah. and uh, it made the largemouth a little trickier. And I found a couple of areas that were good with largemouth and a mix of smallmouth, just fishing grass. That's what I wanted mm-hmm. to do with fish grass. I knew there was going to be a deep bite, but I was kind of hard headed and didn't even look for it. And uh, I found some shallow areas and had a decent first day at 18 pounds and caught plenty of fish and kind of left them biting. And I think what I messed up the second day is I went to some of my grass areas early and I don't mm. think the fish pulled into them till later. And I kind of panicked and started running around when I should have been been there at lunch rather than been there at 8 a.m. Yeah, and I think that's where I messed up the second day is I didn't wait on the fish. I, I'm a big advocate of if you fish somewhere and don't catch them, don't go back because it's not that they weren't <laughs> biting it's that they weren't there but yeah. i think that was one of those rare situations where the fish were actually pulling up later in the day rather than being there all day so yeah. I, I, I took my own advice and didn't go back but i think it was one of those situations the kind of rarities that i should have yeah I, I, for some reason and it's funny you say that i think you know that happens a lot up up here in, in north mm-hmm. which is kind of weird um, I've noticed that a few times where I'll find a bite in the afternoon and it's when it's up shallow, if when they pull up on something mm-hmm. and then I'll go another day, maybe whether it's the next day or a couple of days later and I'll go first thing and I'll stop in that area and I won't get bit at all, but I'll kind of, I'll try to like think about it 
and say, maybe I have to pull up, maybe it's a bite window, maybe it's because they pull up in that area once the mm-hmm. sun comes up, heats up, that sort of thing. And once, and lo and behold, same time period, you come back, they're there. It, it's a weird, weird it aspect is. of that. And it's, you kind of see it a bunch in the north, at least up here. I'm in the heart of the Finger Lakes, and I know mm-hmm. for sure that happens. And you ask any guy mm-hmm. who's like a diehard dock fisherman, you won't see him on docks really in the morning. That, at least that, they don't exactly pull up right. on it. Yeah, they don't pull up on it until there's, there's some shade under there. Yeah, I think it happens more so up north than in the south. Uh, I, in the south, I feel like a lot of times they're there, like all the time. Like if they're there, they're there. <laughs> but yeah. I, I think up north in that really clear water, and it's so much steeper. So like those fish could have been sitting out in twelve to fifteen, and they wouldn't have been, but you know, fifty yards from where I was fishing. Versus the south, we got real slow sloping banks. They have to go a long ways. Yeah. And uh, I think that's why they pull up and pull back out so quick. Yeah, and it's weird. The only times you really get on a good shallow, shallow morning bite. Um, is after a full moon when they're still kind of up chasing that bait. That's right. Full moons, they, uh, what I've noticed, I've, I've night fished out here, is you even have smallmouth that'll pull up into three, four foot, of, even if it's thicker grass. Mm-hmm. They push that bait up and it sounds like it's actually kind of cool. It just sounds like it's raining because like the bait's all going crazy and then you just hear cannonballs falling from the sky yeah. all over the place. Yeah, that's cool. It, it's, it's kind of an interesting little deal, but um, Champlain is definitely. It's definitely hard on a lot of people today, especially if they went down to Ticonderoga. Like it was. everybody's saying, how you know this isn't John Cox's wheelhouse, and he didn't. It, it was hard. It was like it seemed like the fish just weren't there down south. Did, did you run yeah. all the way down to Ty, or did you stay? I, I, I did. And I fished like kind of the north end, just fished the grass areas on the north end. But I I didn't go to Ty because I thought the low water would be would make it trickier down there. And talking to the guys that went, I think it did. I I. Yeah. I I guarantee you there was probably like a glory hole down there because of the low water, but I think it's wow. just it, it's just the typical grass flats and typical stuff that you would fish in Thai just wasn't right because it was too shallow, too hard to maneuver around. Yeah, but it was it was impressive to see though the amount of 17, 18 pound bags that were brought in. It, like was. it, was, it was very tight. To, I would say even the top 40 was really tight. Yeah, it, it was. was. I, I I knew that was going to happen, but I actually thought the median weight was kind of going to be 16 when it was really like 17 to 17 and a half. So I, I misjudged a little bit. I, I don't know that I would have changed practice knowing that they were going to catch them like that, but I was paying a lot of attention to the three pounders I was catching in practice, not when that really wasn't the right class fish to do real well in that tournament. I, I mean, I knew it would take close to 20 a day to win, yeah. But I thought I thought that 17, 16, and sixteen to seventeen would be real like a pretty good bag, and it, it wasn't. It, it was a little. Bit, it was a lot better than I thought it would be. Yeah. Well, this morning I think what the the reasoning for that, and and I don't know if you listened to Bass Talk Live, but they had Polinek on this morning, and he made a great point, which made a lot of sense as to why those weights could be uh, heavier than what you you said, like what you expected it to be, mm-hmm. uh, is because. You know, in May, you know, a few weeks earlier, we had weeks of, of 90 degrees. So things mm. got really hot a lot sooner than we're used to. Uh. So what, I think what happened is it moved those fish up sooner. So now mm. like what he, he mentioned was that now they're a little bit later into their summer patterns, feeding a little bit heavier, filling those bellies up, making them a little bit heavier for you guys. So yep. that's probably, I think that's a great reasoning as to why those weights could have been, been up there. Yeah, and, and I did. I had been watching the forecast and knew it had been hot a lot longer than normal. And actually, that was one of my intentions on fishing shallow. I thought that kind of prolonged hot weather, I knew a lot of the smallmouth would go out, but I thought the grass would be in better shape because it had been so hot. It had been growing for longer. And uh, I don't know that it was. The millful just looked funny up there, most of it to me, which is – uh, like at least the times I've been to Champlain, most of the large mouths use the millful. The small mm-hmm. mouths and large mouths use that kind of cabbage grass, but the millful is where you find a lot of the large mouths. And and it just it was hard to find good millful. A lot of it was kind of fuzzy and weird looking. Mm-hmm. So I don't I don't know what that situation was. It wasn't dead necessarily. It was just had a slime to it, and and I don't really know what that was because I had one large mouth area in the millful that was really good the first day. And it was one of the only little 50 foot square clean areas amongst a bed of millful that was all fuzzy. And I have no idea why the rest of it was fuzzy and that area wasn't. 
Yeah, no, it's that's a common, um, I guess, trend right now, all amongst in New York at, at least. I don't know about our, our nearby states, uh, but I can tell you in the Finger Lakes down here, uh, last year it started. It really started well last spring is where we'd have that healthier milfoil uh, start to grow, and then we'd have two weeks where it got really cold, basically killed a bunch of it. Some of our lakes haven't even recovered from that last year. It's very mm -hmm. hard to find that healthy. Uh, that nice green feathery milfoil that you want mm -hmm. and basically what happened is they haven't really recovered from it so once you can find it they're there but it's also like you said that that algae that slime yeah uh, like you flip your bait in and when you pull it out it's still on it which is not good when yeah. you're fishing grass no no it's it's not and uh for some reason I've, I've talked to a few different people and i've actually i ran into uh, one of the officers from DEC up here, up here in New York, and I had asked him at the boat ramp if he knew what it was from. And he said basically what it is is you have a bunch of these, uh, a few of these days that are constantly just hot, dry, and low winds that are, you know, the very dry, hot climate. Mm -hmm. That's what causes the algae. Okay. Uh, so I, it wasn't a full explanation, but apparently that but is what it's, causes it's, that. It's, a, it's an algae bloom, I guess, on yeah. it. Not necessarily the milfoil itself. It's just an algae bloom yeah. around it, which makes yeah. sense because that is actually another reason that I spent a lot of my practice shallow is there was an algae bloom going on in the whole lake. And there was a lot. I would say I've been to Champlain a couple of times in the past and the visibility was half what it would normally be as far as depth into the water. And I thought that that little bit, it's not dirty water, but it's a lower light condition. I thought that would keep a lot of fish up shallow. And it, a lot of people call them shallow, but I think for the most part, it was uh, pretty well dominated on rock piles and out deep. But, yeah. but the, the algae bloom, I thought, would help out the shallow bite. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it was one on smallmouth. I mean, That's right. Which is which is rare for Champlain, really. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they each caught a few large mouths, but it was pretty much. I heard the uh, live release boat talking one day when I gave my fish back for them to go release them, and the biologist there said, "This is kind of a strange bag we have here for the weigh-in." They said we have over eighty percent of smallmouth. Wow. Which is not normal for Champlain. I know there's a lot of smallmouths, but usually some of those twenty-pound bags are largemouth heavy, and this time they weren't. Yeah, and I definitely think that if conditions were a little bit different, you probably would have seen Seth probably not go for smallmouth like he did. Mm -hmm. If he had some sun, yeah, he's, he's a large mouth before. master. So. Exactly, <laughs> and you probably wouldn't have seen BP run into the smallmouth that he did with that if the wind didn't blow. That's right. I think that he definitely was fortunate for that, those conditions, but that's what term term is term fishing is right. You know, adjusting to those different changes and whatnot. But, yeah. but dude, before we get Two more to that, because I could ask you questions <laughs> fishing all day long, but when did you get into fishing? What's that first story like? Who got you into it? What was that yeah. first bass you caught? Yeah, so I started, I, I've fished before I can even hardly remember. I mean, I, I grew up creek fishing, you know, and then we had a pond in the backyard from the time I was like four years old. But I fished my first tournament, actually, with my dad. He, uh, that, that's who started me off in fishing pretty much, and we fished awesome. clubs and stuff. I fished my first tournament when I was seven with him and uh i remember the it wasn't the first bass i caught but the first tournament bass i caught was a three pounder that i caught on a tiny torpedo in the bowers rogers tournament with my dad and uh <laughs> i remember that bass forever i actually hooked him and he swam through the hole and some chicken wire on the side of a dock and then he swam back through the same hole and i caught him so <laughs> it was pretty cool but that was my first ever tournament bass and it just really progressed from there i mean i fished tournaments with my dad and it it kind of got to the point not that my dad doesn't love fishing anymore but it got more serious than he wanted to fish he, he was like you know your old school guy that we fished the same 12 banks no matter if it was january <laughs> or august we were going to these same banks and uh then i started learning more and more and started going by myself in our boat when i got my boater's license when i was 12. That's and awesome. uh, he would take me to the lake on our 18 foot Stratus and drop me off and let me fish all day by myself. <laughs> and uh, I started kind of figuring them out a little bit and uh, started fishing tournaments from there. I, th I fished BFLs. That that's what mm -hmm. I think really led to like fishing pro was BFLs. That's one of the. Yeah. It, it, it's a. It, it was a bigger trail to be able to fish that you could actually get somewhere. That's that's what I tell people. A lot of people ask me like, how do you get to pro? And I, I don't have any real answer on. I mean, obviously you qualify through the opens, you know, but. 
as far as you want to fish stuff that you can get somewhere from, whether it's the Federation with bass, BFLs, get the FLW, just bigger stuff. And that's what I worked my way up through the BFLs, made it the FLW tour, kind of got my foot in the door professionally, and then now moved to the Elite Series. It's pretty awesome, dude. Mm, yeah. So it's, so uh, when did you start fishing? I know you said you started tournament fishing pretty young, obviously. Uh, as you got the boat and everything, you probably progressed. But when did you start fishing the BFLs, and when did it kind of click for you? Now, I'm sure you've been asked this question a bunch of times, but uh, when did it kind of click for you that you wanted to do it for a living, that you didn't want to do anything else? Yeah, well, I, I've always, I mean, you know, you got your little dream, your dream as a kid. And I mean, yeah. when, I was, when I was seven, I wanted to fish professionally. I, I mean, that was what I wanted to do. But there's actually some a newspaper article here that says seven year old dreams of being professional angler. It was me holding up that three pound bass. But um, so that I knew I wanted to do it forever. But then, you know, as you get older, you kind of start looking like I went to college and was intending to be a game warden. I went to school for wildlife and fishery okay. biology and uh, kind of I, I mean, obviously, I fished BFLs. When I started when I was 15 and fished them all the way through college and all that and wanted to fish professionally, but really was looking at a job and who knows what would happen and then made the uh made the bfl all american and qualified for the tour in 2014 or 15 i think 15 and uh my first year on the tour was not awesome but good enough to like well you know i might can do this and then really kind of did well my second year finished third in the forest wood cup and all that so that was kind of my second year on tour was when i think it was 2006 15 or 16 was uh when i knew like you know what i can probably make a living doing this i i, I can i can do it that's pretty sweet yeah i remember watching that the, that forest wood cup when you know, that was kind of like when people started to hear your name a lot more and mm -hmm. that was pretty cool and i yeah, think you're probably cool. wearing that same zoom hat and that, i was yeah <laughs> i was i got a whole box of them I, that's one of the things i was going to ask too is if you wore the same exact hat or if you had more than no nah, <laughs> nah, this was getting actually a little worn out they turned pink after a while and then I, I, I got the thing is is they actually were discontinued and i've been we've been working on getting some more back out because people really have sought or this hat sought after after i've been wearing it so long and uh <laughs> i've got about 40 left probably and that's the last ones that's it there's no more red zoom hats uh -oh. so, of, the, of the exact model i mean i'm sure there's some comparable but yeah but uh, the ogs yeah <laughs> so i we, we gotta get some more i gotta get zoom to get working on making some more I know. Yeah, this is like my trademark hat i've worn it forever <laughs> i was gonna say i don't think i've seen a picture of you where you weren't wearing that red zoom hat uh, no this is this is my hat it was my good luck hat then and i was like man if I did good in this tournament i'm gonna wear it forever <laughs> yeah. i wear them till they get pink and then trash them yeah i was uh i was fishing with destin demarion the other day uh he he took a, he came by on his way home to pa um and he was i told him i said how you're coming on the show today and uh he's like i don't think i've ever seen his hair before <laughs> joking because I mean, you're always wearing that <laughs> that was really funny but. i've got hair it's receding a little bit but i've still got it Oh, I'm right there with you. There's a reason why I'm always wearing a hat, too. <laughs> I, I think my Falcon runs 70 everywhere. It blows it out. That's what I tell everybody. That's why my hair is receding. <laughs> Spend too much time on the boat. You know? Yeah, that's right. That's funny. Well, dude, we're a couple tournaments in, and we have what? There's So there's St. Clair. I know there's Gunner, Gunnersville Chick and then Santee, that's correct? Right. Yeah, and Fork. And Fork. Yep. Okay, so, so Fork, you're probably pretty excited for that one. I know it's a different time yeah. of year, but – yeah, I really like that. I, I've actually, I, I've learned over the years that the tournaments you really look forward to, that you're like, oh yeah, I know what to do there. Those are usually not your best ones. It, it's yeah. usually, it, it's a lake you don't know much about a lot of times better, which what I like is, yeah, we're going to lakes this fall that I, I've been to, I know what to do, sort of, but we've never been in the fall. So it, it, you go into it with a completely different scenario. So I'm actually, I'm really excited. And, and, like I've had a rough northern swing this past one. I've done well at St. Clair a few times, so I'm excited to get there. But nor the northern tournaments have always, the smallmouth tournaments, have always kind of been my Achilles heel as far as Angler of the Year goes. Like I, I'm excited to get back to typical reservoirs for the fall, but then I've got to get the north figured out. Actually, I hate to say it, but these last two in New York, I think, were my eighth eighth and ninth tournaments in New York, and I've never got a check in New York. Oh man, is yeah. it a smallmouth thing? Is it just because you like fishing shallow? Is that all? Right? 
it, it is to an extent, but I also know what it is. I figured it out in Florida. So I, did, I had basically the same luck in Florida for my first three to four years on tour. And growing up in the South, we don't have a lot of fish in one area ever. Like it, it's just the way it is. Like if you find them, you find 10, you don't find a thousand. Like it, it's just not a lot of fish. So I tend to fish very, very fast. That's just the way I fish and cover a lot of water. If I catch one, I'm like, oh, cool. I caught one. I'm going to find another one now. Well, up north to me is very similar to Florida. I know it's opposite ends of the spectrum, but when you find them, there's a lot of fish in one area. And 90% of the time when I go up north, I fish through them. I catch three or four, like, oh, that was a good spot. Caught three or four, and then I go somewhere else. When you're better off, just kind of milking an area out. And that's that's the thing that I have. So the northern lakes kind of lay out a lot like typical lakes I'm used to. So it makes me fish like pattern wise. When it's not, it's more area wise than pattern. Florida, I've got used to it, the tournaments I've done well in Florida. I've done well the past few times in Florida are the tournaments where I put my trolling motor down at takeoff, and at most, I crank the boat up one time a day. And yeah. a lot of times that's how New York and Northern fishing goes too. And I, I just, I tend to fish through the fish up there. And I think that's what I did last week. If I'd have waited them out in a few of my areas, I probably would have caught them. So it, yeah. it, that, that's kind of what, what I think has been my weakness up there. I've kind of got dialed in, in Florida and I just got to make myself slow down a little bit up North and really, really capitalize on what I find. Yeah. It's you, you pretty much know it on the head. I mean, up here, you know, especially Champlain too, cause you look at Champlain and you get so entranced by the scenery and everything. And you look at the bank and it's like, everything looks good. Mm -hmm. And like, you just want to run that and that and that. But in reality, one of those spots is going to have, one will, one will have a couple rogues here and there, but then one will have the school that you can sit on for a good amount of the day yep. and you can come back to cause it's going to reload. That's right. Uh, that's a lot of, of what it is. There's a lot of just key areas where, those quality fish are going to stick to you. And once you, when you catch one or when you find it out, when, when you're graphing or whatever it may be, you have to hone in on it and pick it apart. And that's mm -hmm. you pretty much nailed it right on the head, but those smallmouth, man, they must, I like the St. Lawrence river. That's a, that's a tough one too. It's yeah, just, that is. Cause it's an amazing it's fishery and it gets a, such an amazing reputation. So you, you figure when you get there, they're everywhere and you're just going to catch them. That is it's, not that easy. No, no it's, it is in practice, but then for some reason in the tournament, I, I think I've been there 14, I fished there 14 days now, not times, but 14 days. And I still don't have the slightest clue how to catch them at the St. Lawrence river. I always have a decent practice, but it's like one of those days where, where at the end of practice day, I'm like, well, I had 22 pounds today, but I caught a five pounder here, a five pounder here and a four pounder here. And I don't think any of those places are actually good places. I just caught one. And that's kind of the the thing I always that gets me in the tournament because I go back to where I caught that five pounder and there was nothing else there. Or I don't spend long enough to see if there's something else there because I don't have confidence in it. So St. Uh, St. Lawrence River really, really kind of kind of tricked me over the years. So hopefully I'm sure we're going back next year. It's on the schedule, so I have to figure it out. But it, it's, a, it's a difficult place for me. Yeah, it's it's smallmouth or so – they're stupid, but they're so smart at the same time. Really, it's just getting a bait in front of their face. And right. nine times out of ten, they're going to inhale it. That's so right. But they move so much. That's, they, they, that's they the do. And they seem like they bite. I mean, not that they, they don't bite. Yeah, like you said, they move, they move like hourly. Like they come, they're predictable, but they don't aren't in the same place all day. Like, like we were talking about Champlain. I think I would guarantee you almost the place I caught 18 pounds the first day. If I'd have stuck it out, I could have caught 19 or 20. And if I'd have stayed on it the second day, they would have came back to me and I would have caught 18 plus. So it, it, they, they, they're predictable, but they're not there all the time. Yeah. It's, they're definitely interesting, interesting creatures to try to figure out. I mean, once you find them, you're going to have a heyday as long as you can keep up with them. That's right. And, there, and there's certain, by, like the river is, I will say this because I'm ashamed to say it too. I never fished the St. Lawrence specifically, specifically just targeting bass because I have been restricted to a kayak majority of my life. But I will say in a week, I'm actually headed up there to fish it for a week. Uh, right. There's a fed that I'm doing as a co-ang of my buddies and I are going to go out there and fish that. Fun fish the uh, Ontario afterwards. Um, but I have fished Ontario a good amount of times and Erie, they both fish completely different than what I'm told on the river. And uh -huh. I can say that firsthand. You know, Erie and Ontario, those fish are pretty easy to 
like, kind of predict, and you can – it's kind of an easy way to narrow down on how to catch them. I mean, you can just drift. You can drift over an area, or you can simply just – Lock your head down on your 2D and just move around, and you see when you drop. Drop, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Which is actually kind of fun because I mean, I don't. You're from South Carolina. I doubt you've ever ice fished. But I've, ne I've never ice fished, but dropping on smallmouth like that is actually something. I, 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 I don't. I don't make myself do it much in the tournaments up there, but it's very similar to spotted bass fishing around here. We do the same thing. Like it's uh get out on points and 20 to 30 foot and we troll around you look for one and catch them one at a time, pick them off the graph. So it's similar. I just have a hard time making myself do it up there. Yeah. No, hundred percent. Yeah. For, for ice fish, that's the only reason I ice fish for me. It's yeah. just because it gives me some more training in the off season to get in tune with my graphs and learning how to kind of trick fish that might be suspended, stuff like that. But, yeah. yeah, it's it takes a lot to, to learn. I mean, it's for you guys, you know, in like California, they have some smallmouth fishing, not to the, the Great Lakes, but mm -hmm. you really you don't often see guys who aren't from the north that do well on a fishery like that. That's it's right. those guys that are from areas, you know, like like Mueller from Vermont or the um, it sounds like you need to go up to Canada for a little while and train That's yourself right. on some of these smallmouth. That's but right. It's, it's tough to adjust, and you know that's why you see some some of the northern guys struggle down south. That, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's just a different style. I mean, it's hard right. to be good at every. I think there's every fisherman out there has something they know is their weakness, and and a lot of times that weakness is your strength in other places. Like finesse fishing, for instance, is is not my strength, but a guy who's a awesome finesse fisherman does well at spotted bass and up there, but then he's gonna not do so well at some southern type tournaments and like my strength is fishing fast well it turns into my weakness when we go to places like that but then it's made me so much money over the years you don't want to change your style you just have to figure out how to make it work for you no 100 percent. and i think with that being said though those guys from you see guys from california seem to kind of do the best wherever they go not everywhere but the majority like you see like a lucas or an ailer you know mm -hmm. they're good just about in every area they can be competitive where they can adjust right. quicker because they have so much variety out uh, there, mm -hmm, but it's, that's right. It's interesting, but so with that being said, do you get excited when you go north, or do you not get excited when you go north? I thoroughly enjoy fishing up there, but I don't look forward to a tournament up there okay. because, and, and it's not because I know I, or I think it, I don't go to any, into any tournament thinking I'm going to do bad, <laughs> but yeah. it's hard to not think back over the past six years and be like, um. I don't I hadn't got a check in New York yet. So why I think this is going to go any differently, but yeah, yeah. I like, I love going, I mean, it's not like even so Champlain, the two, the two tournaments that I fished there has been the most fun butt kickings I've ever had because <laughs> I mean, I caught a hundred fish in two days in the both tournaments I fished there and just barely missed the cut each time which it wasn't a good tournament. I missed the cut, but I caught a hundred fish in two days. Like you, you yeah. don't do that in the South. I mean, it doesn't happen. So yeah. it, they're fun places to fish. I just, I, I'm always just a couple, a pound or so out of there. The same thing when I fished the tour there back in 2016, I think I caught a ton of fish and had, had was on pace to do well and just had one kind of slower day weight wise, not catching wise, just weight wise. Yeah. Now it's gotta be mentally tough uh, for you to go into because you, all you guys, I'm sure, go into these tournaments with the idea that you want to win. Obviously, you want to cash a check. You want to do well. But obviously, the number one goal is always to win. So, you know, launching and getting ready to blast off and looking to your left and right and seeing the Johnston brothers that live up there and know it so well, That's it's right. got to be kind of like a knock to your confidence level when you're going out there. It is. I mean, it just takes having a good couple of days of practice. Like, you got to key in on the right thing, and then you're just – I mean – at our level, anybody can win at any location, whether or not it's in your wheelhouse. It's just all about keying in on what the right deal is. Like, And a lot of times, the tournaments you do the worst in are the tournaments where you might have found them the best. Like mm -hmm. Champlain, I, what I was doing, I caught them pretty good in practice, some of the areas I was fishing, and kind of keyed in so much on it. I knew everybody was fishing deep, but I didn't do the thing of everybody else, and I – and 
it, it's it, when you don't do what everybody else does, that's the tournaments you either win or you finish way down in. That's the way it always works. I, I learned that a long time in the tour. If if it's a tournament where it's not exactly in your wheelhouse or you haven't found them that good, you just have to fish what – like Champlain, a whole practice, I saw everybody idling out deep for rock piles, all that. I, I, I knew. I was like, well, everybody's fishing deep. They're going to catch them deep. Well, by going to do something else shallow, you're either putting yourself in the situation to set yourself apart and win or self, set yourself apart and do poorly. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of one of those things you can go do. Uh, like you, Usually, I didn't – I didn't do what I normally would. If it, if it was a lake I'm not real confident in, I knew everybody was fishing deep. If you do the same thing as everybody else, you just got to catch them a little better to keep your points up there. And that's that's what I didn't do at Champlain. I kind of set myself apart, hoped it would turn into a top five, top ten finish, but it, it didn't work out. But I don't regret it. I, I like to set myself apart and do something different. Yeah, I totally hear you, dude. I don't like going with the crowd. I mean, I can't really speak to the level that you guys do, but I can speak to – um, and hopefully I can get into these boat tournaments once I can actually afford a boat, but student loans got me kind of holding the head back <laughs> right now, but on a, on a kayak level, the, the easiest way to set yourself apart from the majority is you find a place that's far away from any launch mm -hmm. because not many people are wanting to put in three, four miles before, you know, you even start fishing. That's not, right. so just kind of get out there and beat the bank. Mm -hmm. But I can totally, I totally agree and see what, what you're saying there, but um rest of the season though looking ahead are you excited for the fall swing i am i am i'm really excited because it's it's gonna be oh we got our southern tournaments that are gonna be i'm not gonna say it's gonna be like bad fishing but it's not gonna be all out slug fest i mean it just santee and fork and and uh chick and gunnersville even i mean in the fall they're just they're not that good it's not what it is in march and february mm -hmm. so we don't Fishing the elites, I mean, the way the schedule's always been designed is they want us to smash them at every tournament, which I get. I mean, that's for TV. It, it makes yeah. a good show. Yeah. But I like the tough tournaments, and we don't get to have them very much. And I think we're going to have four, like, pretty tough ones this fall. I mean, I think you're going to see – there's going to be a lot of not limits. I mean, I, I don't think it's going to be one of those tournaments where everybody catches them. And uh, I, I'm not real familiar with Santee, but it's close to the house. I've been there quite a few times, and – in the fall it's just not good i mean that's just the fact of it it's it's it takes 30 pounds in the spring and teens are good in the fall so yeah. it, it's uh i'm excited to have a couple of those kind of grinders and where where you don't know you're going to catch five fish going into the tournament i, I like that type of tournament I, it's it's a different mindset versus i just got to go catch five versus you go to champlain you're like well i got to catch four pounders to do any good <laughs> so I like I like the tournaments where it's tough to catch a limit. That's what the the Forest Wood Cup was always that, and I always did well in it. So I'm I'm excited about the fall ones, and it's gonna be a big point flip flop probably, which I, I haven't had the most phenomenal year so far. So kind of helps me out if we have some tough tournaments where it kind of flips points around a little bit because it it gives me a chance to make up some ground. Yeah, well I'll tell you from a fan standpoint, you know I'm sure you know Bass with ESPN two would love to see. Uh, a smash fest just so they can you know draw people in who may not be most familiar with the sport watching you guys just catch giant bass left mm -hmm. and right but from someone like me who are like I even the reason i built this podcast is because i can have folks that, like like yourself on so i can learn that type of deal but also learn like about your stories and that whole nine yards but all i all i base my fishing on is learning like i don't really have any goals of going pro or anything i'm just i, I have a passion for it I want to learn as much as I can. So when you guys have those grinders is when I get excited too to watch because mm -hmm. not just because you guys catch fish, but also just to kind of watch the decision making that you guys make while you're on the water. So when times get tough, what do you do? How do you adjust to it? Do you put your head down and know that a bite's going to come or do you make a switch? You know, how, what, what does that happen? Because it's such a mental game. It and is. I think that is probably where people are most weak, even if you're, you are a strong fisherman in so many factors. If you don't have a good mental game, you're you're not going to do well in tournaments. That's so right. I think that's that's probably the for me at least. I I love a grinder at least watching it because you can kind of see how your guys. You might not talk about it openly on camera, but you can see kind of how you guys are making decisions. What what rods you put down, where you might pick up and, and motor to somewhere else, or how you kind of might adjust your game. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, but that it's. Do you think guys are going to – the weights are going to be lower because it's tougher fishing, or do you think because majority of the guys are mostly in a tree stand that time of year and not <laughs> out on the water? 
it, it definitely I, I think a lot of the anglers are not as familiar with fall fishing as they would be in spring because now most most anglers do hunt a lot in fall I, myself included but i love fall fishing too i i uh, around here that's my favorite time of year to fish i've got a little aluminum boat i love fishing up the rivers and doing Absolutely. some different things in the fall so fall fishing to me is you're more like in the spring and early summer even you're you're looking at fish that are they have an intention the fish are going to spawn or just leaving spawn to go back out deep when well, the fall you're more fishing for fish that are just they're they're following bait they're moving around they get real scattered and, and it's a different you're not looking at oh they stage on this point to go to this flat you're looking at where's the bait you know it's, it's a lot different it's a lot different strategy in the fall versus the spring because the fish are not funneling to somewhere they're just kind of roaming and eating yeah it's definitely interesting and it's I, i'm excited for this year this is my first fall out of college where i'm actually going to have the opportunity to fish because i've always either had school and sports to focus on. I yeah. really didn't have time to really put it like a lot of effort into fishing. So for me, I already have my game plan set up where, you know, the days that are really crappy weather for going out fishing, I'll be in a tree stand. And then all the days that are nice, I'm going to get out and kind of learn how this fall fishing is going to set up. Yeah. And I'm, I'm trying to mentally prepare myself to go out there and absolutely suck. But I, I it's going to be fun to kind of to learn the new things. But <laughs> is is there a lake in particular though that you're more excited for in the fall than others? Um, so I'm excited about Gunnersville in the fall. I, I've fished it a good amount of times in the spring. I don't think I've ever fished in the fall. Maybe one time, but uh, it's kind of be one of those tournaments. It's going to be a grinder. It's going to be a flipping and frogging fest, and that it's it's not going to be a bunch of fish caught. But it's two of my favorite things to do, and uh, I'm excited because it, it's. That's actually going to be one of those tournaments. I mean, it could be one doing something different, cranking something like that. But kind of one of those tournaments, you know what you need to do going into it to win. It's just you got to find the area. The only thing that's going to be a little weird about it is there's actually they have a spro frog tournament every year. I don't know if it's spro frog, but a frog tournament every year on Gunnersville that has like 500 boats, and it's actually the same weekend as our elite series. So I don't know how that's going to work. If the lake's off limits for those guys during the week, it'll actually be better for us because there won't be any locals on the lake, but I'm not sure if it's sure. off limits or not. So it's yeah. going to be a little, it, it might be a little crowded. Gunnersville's crowded anyway. That's one of the biggest things going there that you have to, you have to factor in is there's people fishing everywhere. I mean, the whole lake everywhere. So it makes it kind of tricky when you're trying to uh, run around because people are on half the stuff you want to fish and you got to find something kind of off the wall. So you're not going to go get on, was it Brown Creek, Rip Rap, or Good <laughs> Bay with Pan Optics? I, apparently every tournament's won on uh, Brown Creek, Rip Rap for the last four years. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the Guttersville is one of those lakes that it, it gets fish like that, but it just keeps putting them out. So it's it's yeah. it's a crazy place. Chick, Chick will be fun too, though. I fished a BFL regional in like 2012 at Chick in October, about the same time we're going. And I really like that tournament. It's it's a lot. It's similar to Gunnersville um, that time of year. So, looking forward to that one too. Santee, you yeah. would think you would think I'd be excited about it because it's in my home state, about two hours from me. But to be perfectly honest, I have never fished Santee in the fall, and I've only fished it a few times in the spring. So <laughs> it's uh, I don't I don't know any more about Santee than I do about you follow Alabama. So uh, I, I, it's not like I'm a got a local advantage there. I probably should, but I don't go there. So yeah. I, I passed, I mentioned to you earlier how my brother and I drove down to Florida and on our way back, we actually went over the bridge of Santee and I believe it was on the east side. I look off and I see the huge flat back there of just submerged timber and I kind of just drooled on the window wanting to stop because it just looked lake. incredible. It's uh, a good lake, a nightmare to get around. I, I bet. I, <laughs> that's where the only advantage is of having a kayak. That that's is right. the only advantage. That's right. Yeah, you could get some sneaky places in it, but the bass boat's a little tricky there. I, I've only been there a few times, and I think twice I've left without a lower unit. So oh, no. <laughs> there, there'll, there'll probably be some uh, there'll be some mercury lower unit casualties at the tournament this fall. <laughs> they better bring a truckload of them. Yeah, that's when you wish you could have like the you could do away with the boat rule and get like a jet boat to go around that lake. Right. It's so you have to worry about it. Yeah. It's a real tricky place to get around. Yeah. Which well that that's actually been in recent is that whole boat rule, but that would be kind of interesting. I understand why it's in place, but I it would be so interesting to see how creative 
guys would get with it. Oh yeah, if it, it wasn't one. You know what I mean? Oh like, yeah, at certain places it would you it, it would be one out of a weird boat getting somewhere you couldn't get every time. Yeah, you'd see John uh, John Cox having a uh, Crestliner jet boat. Jet That's boat. What you'd see. <laughs> yeah. That's right. But um, well, looking ahead, dude, I know you obviously we talked about the tournaments coming up, but you've you've had a couple elite tournaments under your belt, and I'm sure I know the answer to this, but I, I want to ask you anyways, what's your biggest goal moving forward in your career? Um, so my goal before last year was to – to win i'd been consistent i'd almost won so many and never won and then i won those last year well yeah. it got kind of weird i won last year and then i lost my consistency so <laughs> it, my kind of short-term goal is to get back consistent and and uh like a lot of people are like win the classic whatever and obviously i want to win the classic but i I th you make a career by being consistent, winning some tournaments, obviously, but being consistent, qualifying for the Classic every year. So I, I just look at points and want to be consistent, make the Classic every single year. Is, it's kind of always my goal going into the season and even looking at the next season is qualify for the Classic. So being competitive, staying consistent, staying yep. in your wheelhouse, and just fishing for a living. That, that's right. W wins will happen if you're consistent. So Yeah. I like that. I like that. Uh, you, like you said, a lot of people say, well, obviously the classic, you know, yeah. it's, but obviously it's like you said, it's not one for you, but I like that answer though. Just be competitive, staying on your game. And obviously it's, it shows, I mean, I'm besides, I mean, obviously you've had a, a little bit of a rough year. You kind of stayed in the middle of the pack, but you had a fourth, fourth place that yep. you fall. I got your, your whole yep. six pulled yep. up. That, that's kind of what I'm talking about. You used to, I, I think like in my tour years, six years on the tour, I hardly ever finished outside the like middle half of the field, but I never won. And I'd, I'd only have a couple of top tens. I was in the teens and twenties, nearly every tournament. And it's kind of weird. I switched over to the elites and it's like, I'm either in the top 10 or I'm in 50th. So I, I don't know what I changed, but I didn't intend to change it, but I'll take two wins in one year. So hopefully I'll get two yeah. more this year, but it's uh, the consistency is how you win angler of the year. And that's, I feel like winning angler of the year is a harder it's it's a harder goal than winning the classic realistically i mean it, it's winning angler of the year is probably to me it's one of the ultimate achievements in bass fishing and that would be that that would be if, if i had an ultimate goal it's to win that which comes back to being consistent you know yeah having a, a better three days than uh than your field of 40 was it 44 Something like I th that. I think so, yeah. Something like that. Over three days is a lot easier than being the most consistent yeah. over a six to eight month span, That's however right. long this season has become. Yeah. 40 it's tournament days. Yeah. Exactly. It's a lot harder to do that. And it I think is. that's why it's valued so much higher. Well, not as right. higher than the classic. I think yeah. both of our, our, I would put them on par. Yeah, I would. Respect, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, although the AOI is definitely the hardest, I think, of all things to, to achieve. But It is. I think, you know, you got a couple of tournaments the rest of the year, and I think this is a good opportunity for a lot, not just you, but a lot of anglers to, who might be in, uh, who might feel as if they're in a slump to kind of get back on track and for, it's new for everybody. So it's not like right. one guy, I mean, I'm sure guys have fished in the fall who might not hunt as much, so mm -hmm. they might feel more comfortable, but I think there's a lot of common ground for a lot of you anglers that, you know, haven't fished these big tournaments in the fall. So I think it could be kind of cool, cool opportunity. And like you said, you could see a flop in, in uh, the AOI and, and points yep. and stuff like yep. that. So. And, and, I mean, it feels like it's late in the year, but honestly, we've got more tournaments left than we've had. So yeah. it, it's, it's still it's still pretty early in the year, and we, we've got a lot of – the usually we have our southern tournaments and then the northern tournaments, but this year is kind of backwards, so we've got back southern swing in the fall. So it'll, it'll be cool. It, it'll be a unique yeah. year. It, it definitely is unique because right now we're thinking, oh, man, there's only like one Elite Series tournament left, and then we're done for until March, right? Right. Now, you know, we, we're barely even getting started, like you said. Like yeah. day, so. It feels late, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. And uh, I'm sitting there, and it's like, man, I, if, I, if I find myself in a tree stand and there's a, there's a bass live on, I know I'm not going to see any deer that comes by me that day because I'm <laughs> too glued to my phone. That's but, right. Yeah. But, <laughs> All right, dude. Well, I have a bunch of questions, but we're gonna we can save it for another time. I'm gonna have we'll try to get you back on. I'm sure after a couple of tournaments, but absolutely. Um, I got some fun questions that I like to ask at the end okay. um, right. that good. I don't prepare anybody for. So. All right. 
I'm ready. So yeah. It's kind of unique because everyone's answers are totally different. And what I like about it is not everybody goes the fishing route. You can kind of get a, an inkling of what their other hobbies or passions are. So okay. my first question for you is if you could sit down and have dinner with three different people, uh, they don't have to be fishing industry, could be you know, past, present, they don't have to be alive. Who would you invite to sit down and have a steak and a beer with just to pick their brain? Let's see. Man, that's tough because I don't. So outside, not necessarily in the fishing industry, just anybody. You could be any, you could do fishing. You could do non-fishing. Like there's yeah. guys kind of like split it up. Like a, I know one guy's that usually do like a childhood hero sports and then fishing. But you yeah. can really split up however you want. Well, you I've, do all I, rappers. You can I've do all rappers. Like I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> we'll do one in the fishing first. So. Okay. What one person that I respect a ton in the fishing industry because of what they've made, and I've actually talked to him, so it's not like somebody that I, is unattainable. But Kevin Van Dam is one of the most impressive. In it, it, when I started watching fishing, is his what he did in a multi-year span was amazing. So I'm gonna say eat dinner with him and have a bourbon. I think he drinks bourbon, not beer. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll say that, and then uh, so two more. Outside of fishing, this is tricky. You put me on the spot yeah. in this one because I really got nothing, man. We're gonna have to move on to another one, then I'll be thinking about that one. Okay, you want me to ask <laughs> the next one? You can get some. Yeah, ask, ask the next one. I'll think okay. about that. One. The the next question for you is usually the last question I ask anybody, uh, and it's just super simple, and it's just your favorite fishing memory. Favorite fishing memory. I'll do a. Uh, the young one is I've already told you I'll never forget is catching that fish through the chicken wire on the dock and then oh. my favorite modern fishing memory is catching an 11 pounder in Texas last year <laughs> so I, I, 10, 20 years from now I remember that one just as good as I remember the three pounder under the dock so yeah, the, yeah the, I, I still remember uh, the commentary that you have uh, when you caught that when you're like I'm pretty sure you're like I think it's a bass or something like that yeah. They're like, you thought it was a five pounder or something. Yeah. Well, and- that was my marshal. He said, he was joking with me. He said, that's a five pounder. And that's because when I saw it, I said, it's at least five when it was on bed. <laughs> it was a little bit, little bit bigger. But- <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Because I remember watching it live and I thought I heard the marshal say when he, when he pulled it up, he goes, that's a five pounder. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, what, what? Yeah, I think they eat a five pounder. Like I wasn't sure if you were being serious. He was that. making fun of me because I said yeah. it's a, it's at least a five pounder on bed, and then I yeah. it. it was two you five pounders. Some pretty cool connections though with some of the marshals and people like camera guys. That yeah, come probably some pretty cool relationships you guys make. Definitely, yeah. It's uh, a anytime you have a camera in the boat makes for a good day. But I've got to be good friends with a few of them too. So it's uh, yeah. it's it's cool. You talk about a lot of things and get to they were. So when cool things happen, you kind of remember it forever because of what they've done. I think the cameramen remember it just like us fishermen do. So, oh, probably, dude. And I, I'm, I understand it, but I'm bummed that there was no Marshall program because you know originally when you guys were supposed to do Cayuga, the river, and then Champlain, like mm-hmm. those are all within three. Oh, you're a Marshall. Yeah. So I wanted to do all of them, but I'm also kind of happy that I wasn't because I know if I was at Marshall there, I would just be antsy to ask so many questions. Which is why I have this because this, yeah. this offers me a time to ask questions. But I'm yeah. like, I'm sitting there, I'm like, I know they want to focus, but I want to ask this question and I don't want to bug you guys while you're trying to focus. But yeah. It, it would have been cool and kind of like a learning experience for, for that. But there's, there's yeah. more years, there's many years. I'm sure yeah. we'll bounce back from this stuff. So, yeah, that's right. I, it'll get back to normal, I think. I, hope so. I, hope so. I, I think next year, this time, we'll, we'll look back and go, like, man, that was crazy. But We'll be good again. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, dude. Do you have your two answers? Have you given it some thought? Man, I, I'm not good at this. I'm not even going to be able to give you an answer, I don't think, because I don't follow music, and I can't even think of any uh, celebrity or his, historical type answers I could give you. I, I, okay. I'll think about that one and get back next show. Well, let, let me ask you this real quick then. Did you play any sports growing up? Um, I did for a couple of years in high school. I played football and then I kind of went back to, uh, there we go. That's somebody dinner with Dabo Sweeney, Clemson coach. Okay. I like that. that that's, that's one of them. Cause I, I'm a big Clemson fan. I went to Clemson and, uh, big Clemson football fan, but I, uh, it's funny though. I'm a big Clemson fan, but I went to college there five years. I gave it a little extra victory lap there, but never went to a football game in five years. 
Oh my god! As gosh. big of a fan as I am, never went to a game. Actually, I fished every weekend. <laughs> So. Oh, okay. At least you said fishing. I thought you were going just because. No, no, I fished every weekend, every game. I, I had something to do or it just chose to go fishing. So I never went, but I watched every single one either on, on my phone or on TV or whatever. That's awesome. At least you watched it. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I love some Clemson football. And they actually are good now, so that's cool. Too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like uh, – I enjoy the Trevor Lawrence uh, – have you seen the lookalike that he has? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the girl. They do look alike. <laughs> yeah it's actually kind of scary but it is it is it's fun. but all right i'll let you slide on the all third right, one. all right sounds good <laughs> you remember then you'll have to shoot me yes yeah, we will we'll get back on and do it again give right. us something give us something for the next show yeah there you go well dude i gotta say thank you for taking out the time and i know you're not super busy now you're probably gonna no. hop off here and play call of duty but i might play some tonight for sure <laughs> we'll have to get david mullins on and everybody there you go yeah dude Speaking of David Mullins, he's brought it up. That picture of him at the live well on day four, that is probably my favorite picture that I've ever seen come out yeah. of bass fishing. Yeah. That it w- speaks volumes. It really does. It does. The situation of it sucks really bad, but it, it captured what it captured the day. Perf- the One of the best pictures I've ever seen. Yeah. I think everyone felt what. Not to, I'm sure not the magnitude of what he felt in that moment, but everyone like who fished at a capacity understands what happened when he lost those fish, mm-hmm. understood and took a gut punch for him. When they, right. <laughs> yeah, they, that, that was a, a big bummer. But he's one I would definitely like to get on the show. I actually shot him a message, but hopefully we can get him on here. But when dude, I play when I play Call of Duty, I'll tell him you're hunting him there down. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> tell me that, that weird kid that slid in your DMs. He wants to get you on the show. <laughs> All right, I'll tell him. <laughs> All right, dude. Well, I appreciate you coming on. It's been a blast, and uh, we'll talk soon. Had a good time, buddy. All right. Take care. You too. All right, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed that show there with Brandon. Definitely learned a lot. I uh, got to get a, a little inkling on what his, uh, his roots were like, how he got into fishing, where it's brought him. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, it was definitely a blast talking to him, and I hope I wish him the best on the remainder of the season. Uh, like he mentioned, how he's kind of going on this this slump where he had, he had a great finish at Ufala, but he's kind of finishing in the, that 50th place, and you know that reinforces the idea of how much of a mental game uh, fishing is, and how you can go on these swings um, where you can have these confidence, and how you got to ride off that confidence. Um, and then there's sometimes where you just things just don't pan out your way. Um, and that's what's the beauty of fishing and tournament fishing is being prepared and, not, and knowing mentally that you need to be prepared for different things that are going to hit you, whether negatively or positively, and how to embrace them and then make the most of it. And if you're doing negative, how to change it into a positive and keep that positive going. So that was awesome. Thank you to Brandon again for coming on. Make sure you guys go down below and follow him on social media. And uh, thank you guys again for tuning in. Appreciate it. We will see you guys next time.